Thank you, Father Coop, Father Becker, Reverend Fathers, any honored guests, our viewers back home and in Rome, Pope Francis, <laughs> and finally, my dear brothers. My vocation story really begins in second grade uh, when I first felt the call to the priesthood. However, for almost 10 years, uh, I basically shoved that call to the back of my mind because I wanted to do my own will. And so my vocation story is really uh, mainly a conversion story. And so let's begin uh, with my junior year of high school in 2010. I was running for president in my, gov my government class uh, as the Democratic nominee. <laughs> and strangely, I was the only pro-life pro candidate. I had entered politics because I was inspired by then-Senator uh, Barack Obama in 2007. Uh, and I followed the entire campaign from day one. Hillary lost. Um, <laughs> And uh, at this time, I was on track to become a career politician. Uh, but I lost that mock election, and I basically turned away from politics for a little bit. Though I will add that I then became majority leader of our mock Congress. Uh, long story short, I ran my presidential campaign on a health care bill. Uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, my bill was signed into law with a carefully constructed clause that effectively outlawed abortion. Um, and nobody apparently noticed that. So I guess it was kind of just like we had to pass the bill to see what was inside. Um, <laughs> so at the same time this was going on, uh, I was also in an AP European history course. Uh, it covered just before the Reformation up to the mid-2000s. And um, we were on the French Revolution. And it was really appealing to me because I found myself relating a lot to their ideals. Um, I shared a lot of their values, and I mean, they wanted a new, they wanted to lay a new foundation based solely on reason, and that was attractive to me. And they were also very clear with their laws, and it was all very fitting for an adolescent mind. Um, <laughs> but the target of many of these laws was, as I'm sure many of you know, the Catholic Church. Uh, and for those of you who aren't very familiar with the French Revolution, um, it was extremely anti-Catholic. At one point, they stripped all religious imagery from the Cathedral of Notre Dame and replaced it with... Uh, nationalistic symbols and turned it into a temple of reason. Um, and of course, many priests were killed throughout the reign of terror. So I guess that did kind of rub my conscience the wrong way. Um, but I was able to get over that temporarily. Um, but then one day, a fellow student suggested that we watch a remake of Lady Gaga's Bad Romance. Um, it was redone to help students remember stuff about the French Revolution. And we didn't watch it in class because we didn't have time. but I watched it when I got home. And there was a part in the song where the singer is singing in, his, in a pretty eerie voice. Uh, this is a quotation. Uh, I want your loyalty or I'll get my revenge. I'll take you out till your rebellion ends. Don't want no church. Catholicism's dead. No room for God. Worship reason instead. Uh, that was a bit too much for me. Um, I found that I had really been myself kind of in denial that the French Revolution was anti-Catholic and it was really part of its essence. And um, I had a very Newmanian moment. I put myself into that time period and kind of looked into a mirror, and I was not a Catholic. I was a revolutionary. Uh, I mean, before, my conscience was being rubbed the wrong way, and now a two-edged sword was being thrust through it. Um, and like the words that Christ spoke to St. Paul were really echoing with me, like, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so that was a very, like, I don't know, that was a turning point for me. Um, and there were many of those, but like, I guess now being freed from the grip of politics where I didn't, have, I didn't necessarily have to care about what people thought about what I believed, um, and realizing how wrong I was with my revolutionary ideals, um, I began to reevaluate my beliefs. And of course, I started with two of the most controversial issues uh, because I thought if I could overcome these, I could overcome any of them. And they were contraception and same-sex marriage. Um, I knew the church, I started with contraception, and I knew that the church opposed it, and uh, when I actually sat down and thought why the church would oppose it, uh, I thought to myself, oh crap, she's right. Um, <laughs> and then once I accepted that teaching on contraception, logically speaking, I had to accept the teaching on same-sex marriage, so those two were out the window. Um, and then uh, the, t the church's teachings were making sense to me for the first time, um, and this coincided with me attending a group at lunch on Thursdays at Grand Haven 
first priority. It was very Protestant, but there were really good things in it. Um, but I found myself, uh, oh, it was a group where people would come together and talk about their faith. I found myself, though, thirsting for something more. And that's why I started to attend Mass more regularly, um, but something still seemed to be missing. And so let's move ahead to my senior year. I was taking a Spanish class, uh, and one day we were talking about the Epiphany for cultural, not religious reasons. But um, I was also in astronomy at the time and curious about the star that was leading the Magi. And like, I remember thinking to myself, for whatever reason, I wonder if Pope Benedict has anything to say about this. <laughs> this was my take and read moment, similar to Augustine. Um, <laughs> So I searched Pope Benedict and Epiphany on the computer, and a homily came up that was given just a few days prior. And this is what he had to say about it. Uh, quote, there has been much discussion over what kind of star it was that, led the that the wise men were following. Some suggest a planetary constellation or a supernova. That is to say, one of those stars that is initially quite weak, in which an inner explosion releases a brilliant light for a certain time, or a comet, etc. This debate we may leave to the experts. The great star, the true supernova that leads us on, is Christ himself. He is, as it were, the explosion of God's love, which causes, the, which causes the great white light of his heart to shine upon the world. And we may add, the wise men from the East, who featured in today's gospel, like all the saints, have themselves gradually become constellations of God that mark out the path. And all these people, being touched by God's word, has, as it were, released an inner explosion of light through which God's radiance shines upon our world and shows us the path. The saints are stars of God, by whom we let ourselves be led to him for whom our whole being longs. And that was a jackpot for me. Uh, besides it being completely beautiful, what really stood out to me first and foremost was that, like, he was talking about leaving that debate as to what actually happened to the experts, because it's really irrelevant, uh, relatively speaking. Um, he, instead of focusing on the star, he focused on Christ, which was exactly what the star was supposed to do, was supposed to point to Christ. And so that was also a very deep move. That was very moving for me. And um, everything was beginning to fit together. And reading Pope Benedict, it was like a spark entering a powder keg. I think that's the best way to describe it. Um, <laughs> and things just took off from there. And uh, much has happened since entering St. John Vianney, uh, but to delve into that with great detail would go beyond the scope of this. But um, I think it would suffice, I think, to point to the general trajectory as to what is, uh, I guess, what's the path that's happened. And it can be summed up with one word, prostration. Uh, Pope Benedict once wrote in, well, it was Cardinal Ratzinger at the time, Spirit of the Liturgy, he wrote uh, that prostration, uh, we throw ourselves down and so acknowledge where we are and who we are, fallen creatures whom only the Father can set on their feet. Uh, and that's pretty much exactly what's happened to me here at SJV. Uh, and I've learned, again, to use Pope Benedict's words, um, if you follow the will of God, you know that in spite of all the terrible things that happen to you, you will never lose a final refuge. You know that the foundation of the world is love, so that even when no human being can or will help you, you may go on trusting in the one who loves you. Indeed, in seminary, I have discovered my identity as a beloved son, and that enabled me to accept my vocation to the priesthood more fully and with joy. Uh, and I guess upon further reflection on this, I also was able to realize how little of all of this conversion was actually me and how much of it was God. And I know that I can move forward now even more uh, because I know I trust in the Father who loves me. Praise be Jesus Christ. Amen.